And the next item of business is members' business debate on motion 13815 in the name of Liam MacArthur on Scotland's marine energy industry has potential to grow. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Liam MacArthur to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Back in February 2015, I led a similar debate uh, to this one on the future of Scotland's wave energy industry. At the time, we were reeling from the sudden demise of Palamas and aquamarine power and what appeared to be a crisis of confidence and even existential threat to the future of marine renewables. I took the opportunity to remind the Chamber during that debate of the many reasons to be proud of what we'd already achieved, including world firsts and world onlys, and confident about what could be achieved in the future. I called for bravery, vision and commitment from ministers and politicians north and south of the border. And that is a call I repeat here this afternoon at what Scottish Renewables has described as a critical juncture for the marine energy industry in this country. I'm very grateful to all those who signed my motion to allow this debate to take place. And I'm particularly grateful uh, to colleagues who <coughs> spared the time to contribute to what I hope is a constructive and productive exchange of views. There are undoubtedly serious challenges facing the wave and tidal energy sectors, and these uh, should not be underestimated. I will return to this shortly uh, and look at what might be done to mitigate or overcome those challenges. First, though, I think it is helpful to remind ourselves of why development of marine renewables matters and why it matters that uh, we see it develop here in Scotland. Scotland, of course, has played a leading role in setting stretching climate change targets. This has been achieved on a cross-party basis, and as new climate change legislation begins its journey through Parliament, I'm confident we'll see the same consensual but ambitious approach taken again. Any future targets will, of course, require the further decarbonisation of our energy system, while focus, quite rightly, will be on the areas of heat and transport, where too little progress has been made to date. We also have a way to go when it comes to generation. In that context, a mix of technology, including storage, will be needed, and I believe wave and tidal energy have an important role to play in that future energy mix, helping displace carbon generation from the grid. That belief stems from a view that we should be playing to our strengths, and marine renewables certainly does that. It plays to the strengths of our natural resources. Scotland is home to 25% of Europe's tidal stream and 10% uh, of its wave, re uh, wave resource. It plays to the strengths of our academic research base. Our universities are genuinely world leading in the expertise they have developed over the years. For me, Heriot Watt University exemplifies this, and I say this as a uh, Edinburgh University graduate myself. A shameless plug here for the reception I will be hosting on the 3rd of October, uh, which will showcase Heriot Watt's interdisciplinary work on the blue economy, how we balance the different, sometimes competing uh, uses of our marine environment in sustainable ways. Through its Stromness uh, campus in Orkney, which hosts the International Centre for Island Technology, Heriot Watt has been in the vanguard on marine renewables and more recently taken a lead on how green energy systems are managed, including crucially the use to which that energy is put. All our universities, though, have contributed to our other great strength, namely the skills and expertise within the supply chain. Again, ICT provides a perfect illustration of this, producing graduates at the forefront of Scott Renewables achievements, a company whose tidal stream turbine recently clocked up over three gigawatt hours of renewable electricity in the first year of testing at the European Marine Energy Centre. Indeed, EMEC itself is a further example of where Scotland and Orkney has taken a global, global lead in marine renewables, offering the means for developers to test their devices at scale and in a real life environment. So these key strengths in research, supply chain and natural resources should give us cause for optimism. Optimism about realising our climate change ambitions. Optimism too about the potential job and great uh, wealth creating opportunities, not least through exporting products and services internationally. The offshore renewable energy catapult recently published a report underscoring this potential and reinforcing the fact that the economic benefits could and should be felt most significantly in coastal and island communities. Yet this optimism must be tempered by a recognition of the challenges facing both our wave and tidal industries. As Scottish Renewables point out in their briefing, there is currently an absence of policy certainty and viable routes to market for many wave and tidal technologies. 
In the case of wave energy, we have obviously seen a retreat back into the lab and a move away from funding for specific companies and arrays. Sensibly, Wave Energy Scotland is attempting to support R&D that will benefit all developers and avoid cost duplication of effort. This, though, serves to illustrate that we are talking about technologies that are still at the in innovation phase. Even tidal energy projects, currently much further along the road in their development, fall into this category. Scottish Renewables argue that tidal stream is on the brink of developing from pre-commercial to fully commercial arrays, but cost reduction is still needed. And we need to see this reflected in the support made available, particularly from the UK government. I won't repeat the criticisms I and others have made uh, of the UK government's seeming ambivalence to renewables since 2015 in contrast to the strong support provided by my Liberal Democrat colleague Ed Davey during his period as Energy Secretary. However, inviting tidal stream projects to bid against offshore wind for contracts for difference makes no sense. Both may constitute marine renewable developments, but only in the broadest sense. A competitive mismatch on this scale simply risks uh, seeing tidal developments throttled at birth. A much better approach would be to challenge tidal and in due course wave developers to bid against other technologies, including storage, in an innovation category. This would also chime, I think, with the UK government's stated and welcome commitment in its industrial strategy to promoting innovation. Hopefully I've managed to persuade uh, co colleagues on the uh, Conservative ben benches about the merits of such an approach uh, and that we will, they will now agree to join in making representations to the UK government along those lines. From our previous discussions on this topic, I know the Minister shares this view, but I would also encourage him to look at what more the Scottish Government can be doing to incentivise innovation in ways that help bring the commercial deployment of marine renewables closer to reality. Deputy Presiding Officer, let me repeat what I said earlier. The development of marine renew renewables plays to our competitive strengths, our natural resources, our research and industrial skills, and the world lead we've already established. It provides an opportunity to create jobs and wealth, including in communities like the one I represent. And it is part of the mix of technologies that will be needed if we are to meet our challenging climate change targets. On that basis, as with the debate in 2015, and I very much look forward to the contributions from others and the Minister, I hope we can send out a strong, decisive message from this Parliament about our collective determination to stay the course when it comes to wave and tidal energy. Thank you very much. We move to the open debate and speeches of up to four minutes, please. Alexander Burnett to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, and I'd like to thank Liam MacArthur for bringing this important topic to the debating chamber, and I note my members to my register of interest regarding renewable energy. Now, as we all know, renewable energy is the future. It is the way forward to protect our environment whilst enabling our society to continue. And the Scottish Conservatives recognise that Scotland must maintain its lead in developing renewable energy technologies, including wave and tidal stream. Now, as an MSP from the northeast of Scotland, I must mention how delighted I've been to see the recent opening of a European offshore wind deployment centre off the coast of Aberdeen by Vattenfall, a feat of engineering, innovation and technology that will produce enough electricity to meet the annual power demand of 80,000 British households. Offshore developments like this have an important role to play in diversifying the energy mix, as well as the decarbonisation of energy. Now, we all agree that there must be a mix of technologies to meet Scotland's energy needs and climate change commitments. However, the Scottish Conservatives are keen to see an evidence-based approach to the mix of renewables across Scotland. And it's clear from the ORE Catapult report that the tidal stream industry brings many benefits to not only the job market in Scotland, but the wider UK economy also. So we support research and development in organisations involved in emerging renewable technologies, particularly tidal, to secure a viable route to market. And I'm sure that members across the chamber will agree that it needs to be done in a way that respects biodiversity and protects seabirds, marine mammals, fish, and the marine environment. Now, despite the SNP government stating they wish to support marine and tidal energy, they have still not awarded a 10 million pound prize for innovation that was set up a decade ago. In 2008, yeah, certainly. Paul Wheelhouse. 
Thank you, the Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to Mr Burnett for taking intervention. On the point of the Salter Prize, would, would the member accept that the withdrawal of the 100 megawatts of guaranteed CFD pot money for the marine energy sector has been one of the key factors as why no developer or no technology has managed to achieve commercial scale as yet and to satisfy the conditions of the Salter Prize? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, Alexander si Burnett. Si since 2010, the UK government's allocated over 90 million uh, grant funding to wave and tidal stream technology. So I don't think uh, we'll take lessons that we haven't, or, uh, that we haven't been supporting uh, the industry. But back to the Saltar Prize. You know, in 2008, the former First Minister, Alex Salmon, launched the Saltar Prize in a bid to drive marine energy to generate enough electrical output commercially for at least two years in Scottish waters. But to this day, this award has not been handed out with no light at the end of the tunnel. The prize has been unable to attract a sufficient number of candidates, despite Nicola Sturgeon insisting on redrawing the criteria to redress this issue. In the meantime, two major competitors have gone bust. The scheme remains under review, with experts, civil servants and the industry in disagreement over the relaunch and its cost. Now, with members of the expert committee overseeing the challenge, having to ask for up-to-date analysis of the marine energy industry to inform their deliberations, it is unclear why Nicola Sturgeon is not willing to find an outcome that benefits the sector rather than leaving it in limbo. Now, I know that my fellow member, Liam MacArthur, has spoken about this before, and we join him in his calls for the SNP government to either drop the prize or finally deliver for renewables. So the Scottish Conservatives remain committed to low carbon and the mix of renewables, but we're using an evidence-based approach but does not hinder any area of development. And we will continue to work with members across the chamber to ensure a greener energy system. Thank you. Are we all quiet now? <laughs> Have David Torrance followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Liam McCaffer for bringing this motion to Parliament today and further raising the profile of tidal and wave energy and the benefits it has on our environment, our local economies and our wider national economy. I'd like to start by looking at the importance of these types of renewables to our future. Renewables are absolutely vital to us drastically reducing our carbon footprint and as, as we move away from using fossil fuels, tidal and wave energy are key to fulfilling and maintaining our nation's energy requirements. If we don't properly utilise the renewable sector that we have, then we will simply be unable to contain, continue to sustain the energy usage that we currently enjoy. Furthermore, in order for us to remain as world leaders in this sector, we must continue to invest in both research and development relating to wave and tidal energy and the construction of wave and tidal power stations. The Scottish Government has an outstanding record in delivering investment through Wave Energy Scotland, which was requested to be formed in 2014 for the development of wave energy technology in Scotland. Conversely, whilst we in Scotland are investing, the UK government are more focused on nuclear energy and in fact backtracking on investments that it promised in the tidal energy field. The UK government has rejected plans for a Swansea Tidal Lagoon, which would have been the world's first tidal lagoon power station should it have went ahead. It, wouldn't have, it would have preferred the UK to the top of the league in the world leading industry. We cannot leave it to the UK government to take Scotland forward in tidal stream and wave energy industries. Now moving on to look at the economic impacts of investing in these renewables. According to a report by the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, wave energy could contribute four billion to the UK economy and 8,100 jobs by 2040. And tidal energy could contribute 1.4 billion and 22,600 jobs. This is a cumulative total of 5.4 billion and 30,700 jobs that could be brought into the UK, particularly Scotland, Wales and the southwest of England, whilst preserving our environment and becoming a world leader. Scotland alone has 25% of all Europe's tidal resources. And if enough research and development was conducted, we could become a major world player in exporting green, clean energy and its valuable technology to a global market. But tile and fabrication of biofab, as it's better known, which is based in my constituency, built the Oyster Wave Energy Converter, better known as Oyster 800 tidal device. This device was located in the European Marine Energy Centre in the Orkney Islands. EMEC is the first and only centre of its kind in the world to provide developers of both wave and tidal energy converters with a purpose-built, accredited open-sea testing facility. EMEC is a not-for-profit company 
to date around 34 million but has been invested by the Scottish Government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Carbon Trust, UK Government, Scottish Enterprise, the European Union and Orkney's Islands Council. This has ensured that Scotland retains a leading role in the development of green energy and through this investment has been able to award 84 contracts and has been involved with over 177 separate organisations across 13 different countries. To conclude, President Officer, I'd once again like to thank Lee McArthur for securing this worthy debate. I hope to see tidal and wave energy sectors continue to grow from strength to strength, as they will have an important part to play in the renewable sector and our targets of 100% of ele electricity generation coming from the renewable sector. Call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you very much, and I too congratulate Liam MacArthur on uh, securing another debate on marine energy. His persistence is to his credit, and much the same could be said for many of those involved in the sector itself. And such persistence and optimism are well founded. They are based, first of all, on the far-sighted decision back in 2003 to establish the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, with backing not just from Europe, but also from ministers both here and at Westminster, from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, as we have heard, and from Orkney Islands Council. EMEC did not so much address a market failure as represent a market intervention, seeking to stimulate a potential new energy industry in which Orkney and Scotland and the UK could aim to achieve first mover advantage. And so up to a, 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 a point it has proved to be. As Scottish Renewables point out in their briefing this week, more wave and tidal devices have been developed in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland than in all the rest of the world put together. EMEC uh, takes a lot of credit for that enterprising approach. But it is only right to acknowledge that the last 15 years have seen ups and downs for marine energy. There have been false dawns and disappointments as well as exciting innovations and technological breakthroughs. Perhaps premature talk of a marine energy boom a decade ago did the sector no real favours, but the hard work has gone on nonetheless. Alexander Burnett mentioned Vattenfall, and just as marine energy innovation was getting underway in Orkney, a parallel development was taking place in the northeast. The Aberdeen Renewable Energy Group got up and running in 2002, and it soon identified an offshore wind farm in Aberdeen Bay as one of its central, central ambitions. That seemed just as challenging at the time as achieving commercial viability for wave or tidal energy in Scotland's islands. After 15 years of hard work and ups and downs, it was great to see many veterans of AREG sail out of Aberdeen aboard a Northlink, Northlink ferry for the official opening of the Aberdeen Bay Wind Farm by Magnus Hall, the Chief Executive of Vattenfall, and by the First Minister. That event proved that a vision for offshore renewable energy can be delivered if the commitment is there and the right commercial developer comes forward to invest in the right project at the right time. Aberdeen Bay now boasts the world's biggest wind turbines. Like EMEC, this project has benefited from support, financial or otherwise, from both local and national government and from Europe. Where Orkney boasts the European Marine Energy Centre, Aberdeen is now home to the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre. And in addition, there are innovative new technologies also being pioneered uh, off the coasts of both Buchan and Kincardineshire. The very success of offshore wind is, of course, part of the challenge for uh, wave and tidal energy. Wind developers have halved the cost of building uh, and installing turbines in recent years. That means in spite of the good work in driving down costs that's already been achieved in wave and tidal, they have become relatively less competitive in the short term uh, uh, in spite of their best efforts. But Scottish Renewables also point out that an ancillary benefit of offshore wind deployment is a reduced cost of capital for the wave and tidal sector too. And it is precisely access to capital that is needed now for tidal energy in particular to move to the next phase. Liam MacArthur talked about UK government support needing to recognise that these are not yet commercially uh, mature technologies, and I think that's absolutely right. But tidal water, tidal turbines are in the water producing power. Wave has lost some momentum in the last couple of years, but with the right technical uh, uh, progress can move forward uh, too. And like offshore wind in Aberdeen Bay, marine energy in Orkney and across Scotland has huge potential with continuing persistence and with backing from investors and from government at every level, it can deliver another step change for renewable energy. And if it does so, I think we'll be able to celebrate even more progress the next time we come to have this debate. 
call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Jamie Halcro Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank Liam MacArthur for bringing forward this debate and for being one of the Parliament's key champions on renewable energy. Um, I first met him at a marine energy conference over a decade ago as I was heading out of the Parliament and he was getting his feet under the table for the first time. And during the last decade, we've witnessed many ups and downs in the sector. Orcadian images of sea snakes and oysters and all manner of subsea turbines have graced our TV news programs. But the routes to market and full commercialization have often been plagued with financial risk and uncertainty caused largely by subsidy regimes that have failed to support our future energy needs. The opportunity still remains. Scotland still has one quarter of Europe's tidal resource and a tenth of its wave resource. That's not going anywhere, but the real prize as ever is to fuse the academic and industry expertise with great test beds and a pipeline of finance to take projects from small scale arrays right the way through to fully commercialized technology. And the sector has struggled to get to commercialization because there is a circular problem here. Small projects struggle to attract finance because of the high fixed costs, and yet those small projects are the very ones needed to build the confidence to secure the financial support for the larger commercially viable projects. The story and the solutions are of course familiar. When the Burger Hill test wind turbines were spinning in Orkney in the 1980s, the Danish government stuck the best part of a billion pounds into the onshore wind sector and sucked most of the expertise into Denmark, where the turbine manufacturers could also sell their kit. Denmark was open for business while the UK was shut. Of course, it wasn't always like that with our industrial strategy. We used to be proud of our companies and were not afraid to put the best part of a billion pounds into Rolls-Royce in the 1970s, a move which enabled them to develop engines which went on to provide the backbone of a 7.4 billion pound global business. But private investors need to see leadership from government and certainty that policy is not going to change from year to year. The demise of the renewable obligation has been largely disastrous. Marine energy is unfairly being asked to compete with offshore wind technology, which is 20 years ahead and has had the time to evolve and deliver substantial cost reduction. Now, our renewable energies, energies shouldn't be forced to compete with each other through contracts for difference because we do need an energy mix that can develop over time, bringing in technologies that complement each other, harvesting different sources of renewable energy. And that's why the Westminster government must bring in a ring fence CFD for marine. Because yes, it is important to back the winners and the proven technology that's cost effective, but not to give up on an entire source of energy, which is just sitting there untapped in our oceans. And the prize is great. The BVG study for or catapult shows that 8,100 direct new jobs could be grown from our industrial heartlands in Fife right the way to the Northern Isles. And our great academic institutions such as St. Andrews and Harriet Watt Universities are playing a role and could play a greater role going forward as well, driving the research that can make this industry both cost effective and environmentally benign. But these prizes are not won simply with the dead hand of the market at the tiller. It needs the leadership of a UK government prepared to work hand in hand with the Scottish government and industry, albeit sadly without the financial support of European Union structural funds. The economic prize is great. The imperative of climate change and energy security is unavoidable. We must deliver the opportunity of a vibrant marine energy sector in Scotland. The last of the open debate contributions is from Jamie Halcro Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I remind members of my register of interests? Um, can I firstly congratulate my fellow Orcadian, Liam MacArthur, on securing today's members' debate on a subject which is of such importance to our islands, but also to my wider uh, Highlands and Islands region. We've already heard a number of very interesting and thoughtful contributions from around this chamber, uh, and as well as hearing some of the details of projects taking place in the waters of the Northern Isles. Just earlier this week, I had the pleasure of sitting on a panel um, at the Orkney uh, Renewable Energy Forum event in Stromness with Liam MacArthur and also Robert Leslie, who is representing the SNP, but uh, also works for Thor and Orkney Housing Association. And what became very clear was that not just the opportunities that present themselves in the islands, but also the enthusiasm of local people and the organizations, uh, organizations and the good work of bodies like EMEC. And uh, this was highlighted by calls from certainly some people there of actually energy tourism and, and renewable tourism as a potential way of, uh, of dealing with the, the interest in renewables from the island and also wider, uh, wider abroad too. 
But it's no secret that some of the sectors of the Highlands and Islands economy have waxed and waned um, over, across recent decades. And as we look at the growing renewable energy industry uh, in the region uh, with both a sense of pride at its current success, we also have to look with a, hope of, a sense of hope for the future. What we now speak of in terms of projects um, have the potential to be in the industrial successes of the future, providing the clean and renewable energy to support our economy. And it's particularly, uh, welcome particularly that the UK industrial strategy identified one of our main national priorities as clean growth. This was expanded on through the UK government's recent clean growth strategy. Clean and sustainable economic growth will be of increasing international importance as countries around the world look towards addressing their international commitments uh, on climate change and decarbonisation. So Scotland having a leading role in the development of emergent technologies can have the benefits felt around the world while securing our own domestic energy supply at home. However, while, we cons while considering the global context, there's a very much more local dimension that is keenly felt in communities like the, Highland, uh, like the Northern Isles. One area of repeated concern is how renewables benefit local supply chains and provide a long-term basis for training and skills development within the communities they're deployed in. Many members will have heard complaints about the need to import materials and expertise in the wind energy sector. New technologies, however, are an opportunity to get things right. And I think that was, follows on from what Mark Russell was talking about. There are obvious benefits, not just the immediate creation of jobs, but in building a labor market skilled in technology-based professions. There are also undoubtedly local challenges to be overcome. In Scotland, these are primarily geographical. Transmission remains an issue and is, for quite apparent reasons, felt most keenly on the islands. We know that Ofgem is currently examining the needs case for a new Orkney interconnector, which has the potential to provide an enormous boost to the industry local, locally. And overcoming these barriers to success is rightly an area where governments should cooperate, and the ability of the UK and Scottish governments, as well as local authorities, to work together will be vital in making real progress. It's also positive to reflect on some of the achievements of the energy sector itself. In recent years, we have seen a considerable drop yeah, drop in the, cost of the, um, in the cost of the number of renewable technologies as they move from being emergent to established. As a result, we see clean energy that can compete on price, lowering costs for businesses and individuals. The motion before us today mentions some of the UK-level policy decisions around tidal energy. I understand that in the interests of Orkney, have a good level of interaction with the UK government ministers, both in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the, and the Scottish Office. In fact, both ministers, I think, recently visited Orkney. There has, of course, been real progress um, on island onshore wind and a renewed uh, focus on new offshore wind as part of the industrial strategy. In many cases, renewable technologies are demonstrating the sort of innovation that we want to see across the industry, industry and that should be encouraged and supported. Here in Scotland, we have a range of pioneering examples of projects that have a record of development, collaboration, and delivery, all while providing benefits to their communities and to the wider economy. Deputy Presiding Officer, these attributes will undoubtedly be key to building up Scotland as a global centre for renewables in years to come. And that my region, the Highlands and Islands, and my home county of Orkney in particular, continue to play a leading role in developing and making renewables of the future. I call Paul Wheelhouse to respond to the debate on behalf of the government. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, I too, like others, want to thank Liam MacArthur for securing this debate and indeed for the wider members of the Chamber for contributions this lunchtime. I share Liam MacArthur's view that a strong, decisive message being sent to UK ministers and indeed to the sector to show our support for the sector is a very welcome uh, outcome from today's debate. There is, of course, a long history uh, of support for marine energy in the Scottish Parliament. And, of course, I would argue that the Scottish Government, as uh, David Torrance argued, has a strong track record of support for the sector, uh, while support has perhaps not been so robust elsewhere. We are a maritime nation, and much of Scotland's influence on the world is built on our scientific and engineering heritage. And one of the ways that legacy continues is through our approach to the technologies that will power this century and, indeed, beyond. So, as others have indicated, today Scotland is home to the world's uh, leading wave and tidal test centre, the European Marine Energy Centre and Mr MacArthur's uh, beautiful constituency, where more devices are being tested than anywhere else in the world, and, and, and Lewis MacDonald is absolutely right about that. And indeed, the world's largest tidal array, uh, the Maygen array, uh, in the Pentland Firth, is, um, ultimately may expand to up to close to 400 megawatts in scale, and, and scale is a key issue that we'll turn to later. And we have today invested ourselves, as Scottish Government, £23 million uh, in, in that project to get it to the stage it's at. 
the world's most powerful two megawatt tidal stream turbine, Scott Renewables SR2000 device, is a point of pride, as has been said by Lou MacArthur, has generated uh, three gigawatt hours of um, energy so far. And the world's largest wave energy technology program, Wave Energy Scotland, which has to date funded 84 projects and invested 30 million pounds of public support and involving 177 organizations. So these are all great successes. These achievements and others can be attributed in no small part to the consistent and committed support from the Scottish Government and our enterprise agencies, but most of all to the passion, expertise, investment and innovation of this young industry, which I believe we all share the view has such huge potential domestically and indeed in export markets. But despite these successes, the path to commercialisation and uh, it remains, remains a key challenge for the marine energy industry, despite the clear potential of the industry to generate economic growth. The challenge of building a large-scale homegrown success story has, needlessly in my view, been made more difficult by the UK government's decision to remove a ring fence subsidy for marine energy. And we do need to be clear about this. The former Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, did promise a ring fenced uh, 100 megawatts of CFD funding for marine energy, and that was uh, unfortunately reneged on uh, when there was a change of Prime Minister and Theresa May's government came in. Uh, that was removed in December of 2016. We know that the UK, and Scotland in particular, has world-leading strengths in wavel tidal energy, and Lee MacArthur encapsulated very well uh, the three issues, the academic base, the natural resource, and the supply chain that we already have. And I know there are a number of hundreds of jobs in, in Orkney Islands that already depend on the R&D activity around uh, marine energy. We know there's a global demand for these technologies too, particularly if you think of the opportunities in small island states and areas such as the uh, Indonesian archipelago, the Philippines, where this would be an ideal technology to deliver sustainable energy for island communities and indeed at home in our islands. And as the offshore renewable energy catapult has demonstrated clearly, and this was referenced by David Torrance and other members, there is great potential for cost reduction and scale is critical here because Lewis MacDonald mentioned offshore wind and he is quite right. The capital cost is halved of investment in offshore wind and the levelised cost has come down substantially. That has been achieved through manufacturing economies of scale and increasingly large turbines, yes, of course, but also manufacturing volumes going up, as we've seen with solar and onshore wind as well. And we need to get commercial scale projects in wave and tidal energy to make that happen here too. But as David Torrance and others have indicated, you know, significant uh, job numbers uh, potentially by 2040, certainly 8,100 the catapult has, uh, has estimated uh, for 2040 in the wave energy sector and uh, potentially uh, 4,000 in the tidal stream sector by 2030, 10 years earlier. But what the sector needs now is a route to market to enable commercial scale projects such as the later phases of May Gen 2 built, built out. As Bayes was unwilling to do so, I have convened senior stakeholders from across the wave and tidal sectors, as well as the relevant Scottish, UK and European trade associations to consider this issue. And the key aim of the Scottish Government's Scottish Marine Energy Industry Working Group, which is referenced in Mr MacArthur's motion, is to ensure that the sector speaks with one voice, presents a consistent message about its impressive achievements to date, its value to the energy system, uh, the environment and the economy, and the support it needs to achieve its full potential. That group is now halfway through the program, uh, scheduled program of meetings, but I'll make clear if it's re still required, I'm happy to keep that group going beyond uh, the scheduled uh, length of, of its duration. But the group has discussed recent developments and concerns across the sector with a particular focus on finance issues and uh, important parallels with the offshore wind sector that Lewis MacDonald re referenced and our oil and gas sectors in the way that the supply chain operates and the work underway to develop the revenue support case and cost reduction pathway that Mr MacArthur calls for in his motion. I look forward to working, I, I certainly will. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I also should probably uh, declare my interest um, as a, in receipt of uh, feed-in tariffs uh, and uh, RHI support. But in relation to that financial support he's talking about, I know he shares the, the view that uh, an innovation pot uh, in terms of providing finance may be a route forward. Is he, can he update the Parliament on any discussions he's had with UK ministers about that proposal? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We certainly are, are keen to support innovation. As I say, we are directly funding already a number of projects, whether through Wave Energy Scotland or uh, directly in the case of, of Amagen and uh, support for other uh, important companies like Nova Innovation, who've developed uh, uh, the Blue Mill Sound Array. We'll continue to engage industry. It's indeed one of the issues that uh, is going to feature in the discussions of the working group around how we can support industry. We are restricted in how we can directly support the generation of power itself. So 
uh, Lee MacArthur is quite right, innovation is one of the areas where the Scottish Government can support uh, technology and looking for integrated projects through the Low Carbon Innovation Fund and other routes we can try and see if we can make more use of the Government's um, leverage in terms of R&D to support the sector. But I do look forward to working with the group uh, in the coming months given the very useful dialogue we've had to date. I will respond to, to some of the comments um, made in the excellent debate we've had today, uh, if I may, presiding officer, certainly um, in regards to the points that were made um, early on uh, by Mr Burnett. Um, I do I take his point about the Salter Prize. We are all disappointed that has not been yet been awarded, but I would ask him to reflect on the point that uh, the withdrawal of the 100 megawatts of CFD minima has had a, a key role to play in preventing projects getting to that commercial scale and therefore capitalising on the Salter Prize. I do believe that um, that's something that hopefully we can, we can share as an aspiration. Uh, Lewis Macdonald referenced the, the, the ups and downs of the industry. is quite right. There have been a number of those. There are clearly in any new technologies the valley of death phenomenon. And what we need is to have some light of the tunnel, mixing my metaphors here, have an opportunity for a commercial scale development so that do in technologists can see that there is an opportunity having gone through that early stage pre-commercial phase that there is a commercial route form and that is what is lacking at the moment and indeed we can learn a lot from the development of offshore wind. Unfortunately as Mark Ruskell very importantly referenced we do not yet we do no longer have access to rocks and the ability for Scottish ministers to have rocks which re reference the innovative nature of the technology and that's a matter of great regret and we continue to press UK government to provide recognition of the innovative nature of these technologies and to provide them with the support. Uh, I would just like to say a little bit if I may, um, I've overstayed my welcome in terms of the amount of time presiding officer so I'll just move to conclude if that would be acceptable to you. Just to reference members to see the number of references in the energy strategy to the deployment of marine energy but in closing I'd just like to say that we have made many achievements in terms of Scotland's pioneering wave and tidal sectors. I would like to close by mentioning just a few if I may briefly presiding officer developments which are relevant to the discussion we've had. Firstly the EU funded NESI programme uh, nothing to do with the monster in Loch Ness, uh, but everything to do with North Sea solutions for corrosion and energy. Um, completed a call for applications recently and three companies were successful in the call, Symic, Atlantis, uh, EMEC and SSE. Now, SE aims to produce business cases for demonstration projects in the North Sea and a detailed value chain for corrosion across the partners to again to look at the life cycle costs and keep the costs down. Scottish Enterprise has now approved funding for Scottish partners in the last of six transnational projects selected by Ocean Energy ERANET co-fund. Um, the total SE grant for the six projects, don't worry uh, to the, uh, to the uh, office there, I will pass this note to you. Um, but the total SE grant for six projects is 2.8 million. The total R&D spend, including companies and other funding organisations for these projects will be around 15 million euros and projects will start during uh, the course of this month. And finally, uh, Presiding Officer, I'm delighted that Edinburgh is hosting the sixth Ocean Energy Europe conference on the 30th and 31st of October. Having addressed the fifth conference in Nantes, I know this is a prestigious and growing international event which reflects the strong interest internationally in the sector. This is therefore an excellent opportunity to showcase Scotland's marine energy strengths, ambition and appetite to collaborate with our international partners and I look forward to welcoming delegates to Edinburgh uh, and would ask all here that you look to support the promotion of Scotland's marine achievements during the course of the two-day event. And I would just say to UK ministers who may be watching, it would be a great opportunity to announce some stronger support for what is potentially a hugely significant sector, not just for Scotland, but indeed the world. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and the meeting is suspended until 2.30pm.